Hello again, everybody. Uh, and in this case, uh, the everybody I'm referring to is specifically uh, my beloved cohort here in uh, the spring of uh, 2015. Uh, now, as you've probably noticed, right, in most of these modules, uh, we tend to make them pretty generic uh, because our intention, of course, is to not re-record these things from year to year uh, so that we try to uh, record them in a way that that is going to be useful for a number of years down the road. Uh, however, for, for this particular module, I'm throwing all of that aside. And this is made specifically for uh, the group of you all uh, slogging through here to the end uh, in early May 2015. Now, why exactly am I doing this? Well, um, it's not only because I have a particular fondness for your cohort, but of course uh, I do. Um, but uh, there's other factors involved here as well leading me to take a kind of unusual approach uh, here in, in working on this module. Because if you look at the syllabus, uh, the topic that we're supposed to be dealing with at this point uh, is thinking about Catholic social teaching uh, and how it relates to our understanding of the environment uh, or to environmentalism. Uh, and this is one of the uh, primary principles of Catholic social teaching, stewardship or care for the environment, uh, which we haven't really touched on uh, in a significant way up to this point. Uh, in the course, right? A lot of the other topics we've looked at uh, have invoked or have been uh, dependent on a number of those other principles uh, that we spelled out at the very, very beginning of the class. Uh, but this one hasn't really been involved terribly much in, say, things like the death penalty or just war or, uh, in some ways, the economic issues, but we didn't really even get into that there. Um, but when it comes to care for the environment, um, obviously, um, there's a, a clear connection here between uh, environmental concerns and this principle of Catholic social teaching. Um, now, uh, it certainly merits uh, a fully developed whiz-bang module of its own with special effects and, and the whole nine yards. Uh, but if you follow Catholic news, um, you know that there's a little bit of a problem here, right? And that is that this summer, um, Pope Francis uh, who, apart from just being the current pontiff, which uh, should lead us all to uh, look uh, forward to what he has to say on issues, uh, but also a pope who has chosen as his uh, name, as his patron, uh, St. Francis, who is the patron saint of Christian environmentalism. Pope Francis, therefore, uh, who has a particular uh, gravitas on this issue, uh, is about to issue an encyclical uh, within the next few months dealing with uh, care for the environment. Uh, and so in thinking about this, uh, it seems uh, a little odd to really kind of uh, commit to uh, the video camera and the computer, uh, something I'm going to be using for the next few years at least, um, mere months before there's going to be a major encyclical on this that really um, it would be odd to not have addressed in future versions of this course. Uh, and so that leaves us um, here and now because it, this is uh, a very important topic. Um, care for the environment is an uh, essential part of Catholic social teaching. And I also think it's safe to say from my perspective that this is an aspect of Catholic social teaching um, that doesn't get emphasized all that much, uh, particularly here in uh, sort of Midwest Catholicism. And so I think it's important for us to talk about this. Uh, however, uh, I'm not going to delude myself and think I have better things to say about it than Pope Francis is going to uh, here in a few months. Uh, and I don't necessarily want to uh, create uh, the module for the f next few years uh, when much of it will seem kind of out of date uh, here in a month or two. So where does that leave us? Well, uh, it leaves me facing this particular quandary, needing to talk about it, but not wanting to um, make an obsolete module. Uh, and it also, uh, then we have, of course, you, who I have no doubt, wherever you are right now, uh, listening on an iPad or uh, in your desk at your home or work, um, certainly doing a lot of work and, and working on papers and all sorts of things. So what I would propose is simply uh, that we um, really think about this, that we read the compendium. I'm going to talk about some of the specific issues that I want to highlight from it, uh, but we will keep this module uh, on the whole uh, brief uh, to the point and really kind of just emphasizing uh, what I would see as some of the particular 
uh, attacks or questions that I think are relevant uh, to considering this in our particular context here, which is primarily, uh, you know, Wichita area Catholicism, and uh, in particular how we can deal with this aspect of Catholic social teaching in that context. Uh, and so uh, this will probably be much briefer than many of the other modules. I know I've promised that before and haven't followed through on it, uh, but I think in this case it will be. Uh, so of course I would invite you just to use that time then to uh, spend a little more time uh, on the discussion board or uh, also if you are working on your papers as hopefully you are uh, to use this time uh, to to continue developing your papers and to um, work on that so uh, what I want to do then is just talk about some of the real highlights of this section in the compendium uh, and then some of the particular uh, questions or emphases that I think are useful for us to consider in terms of addressing uh, stewardship for the environment uh, in the context of, of Kansas Catholicism. Now, in looking at what the compendium has to say here on the subject of care for the environment, um, I will say for about the last time, or I think in this case actually the last time, uh, that it's striking to me, at least, that uh, it really goes out of its way to integrate uh, biblical tradition and then the broader Catholic tradition uh, to show how uh, care for the environment is really uh, an integral part of our faith. Uh, and I think we've mentioned this, of course, with other topics as we've gone along. Uh, but I think for many of us, things like the death penalty or things like even uh, care for the poor or the marginalized, um, that that's going to resonate, right? That we will see that as being uh, a real concern of the gospel, a real concern uh, at the heart of our faith. Um, and so then when it comes to uh, care for the environment, um, we might have a little more trouble uh, recognizing um, those connections. And so I think it's useful to read especially these first couple sections uh, of this part of the compendium where we get uh, it spelled out how this ties into biblical tradition, how it ties into a Catholic conception of the human person uh, and the world. Uh, to make it clear to us, right, that despite um, whatever other reasons we might have for not really focusing on the environment, um, that it is in fact uh, really rooted in a Catholic understanding of the world and of the human person. Uh, and I think this is a particular area where it's important to really look at what the compendium says in this part, uh, because I think, uh, again, particularly here in a sort of uh, conservative Midwestern uh, environment where, um, of course, in every area there's going to be uh, an influence of politics and an influence of the culture on theology and vice versa. Uh, in particular here in sort of Kansas Catholicism, I think it's unavoidable that there's going to be an impact of uh, the political environment and also of the broader Christian culture, right, because we also live in an area uh, where there are many uh, conservative Protestant um, Christians. Um, and they are going to have a particular way, in many cases, of looking at the world. Uh, and that combined with uh, a particular kind of conservative political view um, can have a real impact on how we understand something like uh, care for the environment, uh, even within uh, the Catholic realm. Uh, and so when you look, for example, at this very first part of the section on care for the environment, um, I think the main point that we can take from this uh, is uh, an emphasis on the church's understanding of the physical world uh, and that the physical world and creation is a good thing. Uh, that it was created good, of course, as we all know uh, in Genesis 1, but that it remains good. Um, and that, in fact, uh, this physical created world is kind of along for the ride with us, if you will, through the story of salvation history. Um, and this is something uh, that I've emphasized in, in my courses on uh, Paul and, and the New Testament um, because I, I think it is something that uh, for a variety of reasons uh, many of us have either lost sight of or, or don't even really understand as a part of our faith. Uh, and I think a lot of this has to do with the context of being in uh, a kind of conservative Protestant culture, at least being in a place where that's very influential. Uh, because in a lot of Protestant thinking, uh, there's a different conception of the world, right? This is very dramatically uh, emphasized in sort of the left-behind uh, view of things, 
right? And in that case, they would say, yes, the world was created good, uh, but the world has fallen into sin, right? And this world is corrupt uh, and evil and, and, and wicked. And that really kind of the way that the story is going to unfold is that things are going to get worse and worse and worse. And then ultimately there's going to be this cataclysm, right? There's going to be the rapture uh, where the good, uh, true Christians are taken away. And then this world is just going to be plunged into a period of chaos and disasters and devastation. Uh, and ultimately the whole thing's going to literally kind of go up in smoke. Um, and then we are going to leave this world, of course, if we're part of that rapture group or if we die before then. Uh, and we're going to be somewhere else, right? We're going to be off in heaven uh, with Jesus. And there may be a new heaven and new earth in some way, but it's really, there's no connection uh, with this world that we see around us outside our window or outside our door. That's all destroyed uh, in God's judgment of sin at the end. Um, and that sort of way of thinking uh, really has, has permeated out from kind of conservative Protestant thinking into the broader culture and into Christianity in America more generally, where uh, many people, even lifelong Catholics, think about salvation kind of in those ways, that this world is separate and distinct from, and, and we're leaving this world to go to heaven, um, which is in some ways true, right? That, that Paul says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, and that there is a way that at death, the body is here on earth and that the soul is with God uh, in some other place, at least in a sense. Um, but the important thing to emphasize here uh, for us as Catholics is that's not the end of the story, right? That um, the end of the story doesn't end with us off somewhere else in heaven with God. The end of the story is going to be um, resurrection, right? That the body and soul will be reunited. Um, that the body will be transformed and renewed, as Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians um, 15. Uh, but along with that, right, that this earth is going to be renewed and transformed uh, in a very similar uh, analogous process, right, that together with the earth, um, we will see the fulfillment of what was begun with Jesus' death and resurrection. Um, and again, this is expressed clearly in the scriptures. Uh, if you look at Romans 8, right, it talks about this world groaning in anticipation of being released from the effects of sin. So yes, sin has corrupted the world. Sin has affected the world. Um, but the world is waiting for the fulfillment of what Christ did uh, initially uh, through his death and resurrection. And that at the end, the world too is going to be renewed and transformed in a way analogous to the way our bodies will be transformed as described by Paul in 1 Corinthians. Uh, and Paul talks about that in Romans chapter 8. Uh, and you can see this too in, in the book of Revelation, which is of course uh, one of the main sources for this left behind view, but they don't seem to have really read the end of it that well, right? That when you look at the very end of the book of Revelation, we don't get uh, a vision of the saints flying off somewhere else to heaven and this world being obliterated. Uh, right at the very end of the book, what we get is a coming together of uh, the New Jerusalem and, and the earth, right? And that the New Jerusalem actually descends to earth, right? And that you get this union of uh, heaven and earth together. And the earth is, uh, becomes united with heaven uh, in a, a new and profound way at the end of all things. Um, so this earth um, has a significance, has a, a purpose to it, uh, that is going to be fulfilled, right? God's initial plan for a good creation is not being defeated by sin. Uh, that sin is going to be overcome and the earth is going to be transformed uh, and renewed and become what God intended it to be um, from the beginning, right? And, you know, one of the things I talk about when, I, when I'm teaching theology um, to people who haven't really thought about this idea of the resurrection of the body um, is that the resurrection of the body lends a significance to the body that is otherwise lacking, right? And I would say this is why Catholics take some of these things so seriously. This is why, for example, the way we use our bodies in terms of sexual ethics is so important, right? Is that the body is not this thing that's going to be left behind. It is an essential part of us that has an eternal significance because of our belief in the resurrection, right? And I would say by extension, a similar line of reasoning can apply to the physical world around us. Right. The fact that uh, we as Catholics and we as people rooted in Scripture can see that this world um, has a real significance and a value that is going to be restored and fully realized by God at the end 
should lend a real significance and meaning to what we do with the world around us, the way we treat the world around us, right? All the way back at the beginning, the way it was supposed to be when Adam and Eve are created, they are made stewards of creation. They are made, given this job of caring for the world. Um, and, right, that is going to be uh, fully realized at the end when the world is perfected. Uh, and we are once again in some way that we can't really understand right now, but in a real way, we will be still embodied. We will still have a world. Um, it will be probably changed in ways we can't understand. But the fact that it will still be there uh, lends a significance to it uh, that I think is frankly lacking uh, in sort of that left behind view of things. But I think that way of thinking about the afterlife, that way of thinking about salvation history, um, has spread out of conservative Protestantism into the broader Christian culture. So that even if we wouldn't accept, say, the idea of the rapture, um, that way of thinking about the world as temporary and, and, and transitional and not really particularly important has permeated uh, into Catholic thinking uh, and other non-left-behind sort of Protestant, Protestant thinking uh, as well. Now, since we've started talking about this, uh, sort of before we leave this very first section, which just looks primarily at the, the earth or creation on its own, I do want to mention, right, one of the things that does get brought up uh, in the compendium's discussion, right, is that you get there uh, a reference to the fact that there are uh, those in sort of environmentalism or the environmental movement uh, who would really um, see kind of creation itself or creation on its own as the ultimate good, right? As, as something that um, has a value equal to, or even really in some of the things you'll see, a value greater than uh, human life or, or human beings. Um, and obviously that is not gonna be compatible with a Christian understanding of things, right? Uh, creation is for Adam and Eve, and they are given a unique place in creation at the beginning. Um, they are not just one of many species uh, on earth, right? So. There's no denying from a Christian perspective that humanity has a privileged position and that even creation as a whole is in some ways for uh, men and women. Um, now that being said, um, I think one of the other things that complicates our understanding of this or thinking about this, uh, particularly for us here in Kansas where we are, um, is that many times um, what we see or we act against, I think, is this, is this distorted view, this view that would see uh, the environment or, or the created world is more valuable than human beings, right? And that kind of anti-human emphasis that you find in some environmental um, movements and some of the propaganda. And so, in a lot of cases, I think there's a natural reaction against that to deny any real value to the created world on its own terms. Um, but I think um, that is ultimately not biblical, right? That um, while, yes, we should reject this idea that uh, the environment is somehow worth more than human beings, um, we also can't swing to the other extreme and deny uh, that the created world has a value on its own terms. We're going to get here in a minute to the importance of the environment for people, which is another key point, but I think before we leave this very first section, I want to just emphasize that the Bible makes it clear that there's a value to creation even in its own terms, right? And there are countless passages to this effect. Uh, the Psalms are full of them. Uh, the prophets have them as well, right? That uh, we hear how the heavens declare the glory of God um, in Scripture, right? We can read in the Psalms, or even actually in the book of Job, there's some really beautiful passages describing the wonders of creation and the sea creatures and the eagles and all these things. Um, and you can see in Scripture, right, this um, pure appreciation for the wonders of creation in its own terms. Uh, it's kind of like watching some of those uh, David Attenborough uh, videos, you know, life or the ocean, uh, where you get these wonderful documentaries kind of showing uh, the amazing beauty and complexity of the world around us. Um, and so there are all these passages throughout scripture that I think affirm the value of the, the created world. And you know, one of the things I often think about when I hear Christians kind of dismissing this, uh, and they will point to passages like, oh, well, you know, um, human beings are, are much more valuable than anything in the world, right? That, you know, we, Christ dismisses them, right? In comparison to all the sparrows you could find, a human being is worth more than that, right? And of course, yes, there are in the parables 
uh, references comparing the life of a sparrow to the to a human being, right? And obviously, God values us much more. Um, but if you think, of course, about this, the logic there, right? That that parable doesn't work if there's no value to the life of the sparrow, right? That the sparrow's life has to have some value for it to be meaningful for human beings to be worth much more, right? If the sparrow is worth nothing, then being worth more than that really isn't saying too much. Um, but there is, in fact, a value to animal life. Um, and that human beings, yes, are much more valuable, but that doesn't mean that there's no value to the animal life or no value to the, the physical world on its own. Uh, and we'll talk more about um, animals uh, in a separate module, but I think it's important to recognize that even strictly biblically speaking, um, there are clear references to the value of creation itself uh, as something that contributes to the glory of God and, and shows his awesomeness and power. Now, of course, as we continue down through the compendium section here on care for the environment, um, you very quickly uh, move from just thinking about the environment on its own to thinking about how the relationship between human beings and the environment ought to work. And, and again, I think this is one of the key things to emphasize uh, when talking about care for the environment as part of Catholic social teaching, especially for those who are maybe um, hesitant about embracing this, right? That this is one of the places where uh, there's going to be a real tendency to see this as kind of just a liberal propaganda in disguise. Uh, because again, I think there are uh, real reasons to be skeptical in that in many cases, those advocating for the environment do uh, undermine other important Catholic values and do tend to denigrate the value of human life, at least in many cases. But um, I think hopefully by now we would all agree that it is an essential part of Catholic uh, teaching, Catholic social teaching, that we care for the poor, that we care for the marginalized. Uh, and so one of the primary points you see emphasized over and over again in the compendium here uh, is that uh, care for the environment is also, by extension, care for others, um, right? Because there is uh, a need for um, a good environment for human life to flourish, right? That people need air, they need water, they need land that can grow food uh, in order to live flourishing lives, right? And so caring for the environment, by extension, provides the opportunity for people to lead flourishing lives uh, and not only right to others in our own uh, time and place, but a point very much emphasized here in the compendium is that this is also a way of providing for the future, right? That we need a world uh, that will support flourishing life for our children and our grandchildren and our great great grandchildren, uh, and that if we destroy the environment now, um, we are in fact harming uh, future generations, uh, and so that's something very much emphasized. Uh, and it's not just, of course, the future either. Uh, that another point really emphasized here uh, is that, again, as with many of the things we've looked at this semester, um, we need to think primarily about the poor, right? In large part because the poor are the ones most often adversely affected by uh, the way we run the world, right? And so if you look at the way the world works um, with environmental pollution or different things like that, it tends to be uh, the poor and the marginalized who suffer the most, right? That when certain areas become uninhabitable for whatever reason, um, and people have to leave, the poor are going to find places to go, uh, or I mean, rather, the rich are going to find places to go, and the poor are not. The poor are going to be forced into those places that are polluted or degraded, um, and they are going to consistently suffer from the effects of mistreatment of the environment. Um, and so that's, again, I think, a way of thinking about why does environmentalism matter? Even if we don't want to emphasize the value of the physical world itself, um, I think we can all recognize that it is necessary uh, for the flourishing of people that we have an environment to do it in. Um, I think another component to add to this, right, that people should at least recognize that we need safe places to live and, and places to get our food and water, um, but I do think it's uh, another thing that emphasized in the compendium here is that um, we need to fight against uh, the particular modern Western tendency to reduce human flourishing to economics, right? And that our ultimate goal is not profit. Uh, it is not increasing GDP, right? And those things are not going to lead to human flourishing, at least not on their own, and certainly not if they undermine other goods. Um, 
and one could argue, right, that you could live in uh, a very materially rich and successful world, but if you are completely cut off from the natural world, that something is missing um, from human flourishing, right? And again, this might be debated, right? Some people aren't particularly nature lovers. Um, but I think a strong case could be made that people need not just an X amount of calories or X amount of clean air, that there is a real value to human flourishing by having um, a beautiful, vibrant uh, environment around us. And again, if we go back to Genesis to see the way human beings are meant to be, human beings are created and placed in a beautiful, fruitful garden. Um, they are not put into a, a prefab concrete building as nice and gleamy and steel and the glass as it might be. Right? They're put into a garden, right? And that there is a, um, a real part of mankind, of men and women, uh, that are connected to the physical world, right? And that we are put kind of at the pinnacle to serve as the liaisons, if you will, between the spiritual and the material. Uh, and so if we're completely cut off from the material, natural world, I think we are losing something. Right? and not just losing necessary inputs for our life, but we lose a spiritual value and a potential for flourishing as well. So not only do we need to ensure enough safe food and water for future generations or for the poor now, uh, we also need to um, think about what is going to allow those groups and ourselves to really flourish, right? And it might be that uh, we should make a choice in terms of how we manage our industry or our economy that is going to reduce profits, going to reduce um, surplus or luxury goods. But in exchange, we are going to get the benefit of a more vibrant, healthy environment. Um, and that can, in fact, be a, uh, a line of reasoning that is not just the liberal propaganda. It is, in fact, rooted in a biblical uh, and Christian understanding of the human person uh, and of human flourishing. So really, at the end of the day, uh, it all comes back to this basic understanding of, of what is our understanding of the human person as Catholics. Um, and we can, on the one hand, emphasize that uh, human beings do have a unique value in the world, uh, and that we need to create policies that are going to allow people to flourish. Uh, and that is going to require the production of a certain amount of material goods, right? That we need to be able to provide for the physical needs of people for them to flourish, right? You can't flourish if you're starving, if you have nowhere to live, if you have no clothes to wear. Um, at the same time, right, we need to acknowledge uh, that while this world is good and while human beings are good, it's also fallen, right? And there are effects of sin. Uh, and there is a consistent human tendency to inordinately pursue our own good and to inordinately focus on certain material goods like greed um, and gaining power uh, and that people will uh, seek those material goods past what is uh, appropriate, past what is proportionate uh, and in a way that undermines the goods of others and in a way that undermines really their own true good, right? That people will often pursue profits um, or economic growth in ways that are uh, harmful to themselves, harmful to others, harmful to the world around them. Uh, and so we need to acknowledge the need for really producing goods and sustaining life and also recognize that there's going to be a need to um, contain that and to make sure that the pursuit of those kinds of activities doesn't go so far that it undermines other goods, the goods of creation, the goods of uh, there being natural resources for others and for the future and all these sorts of things. Now, when we translate this, right, there is, of course, as in many things we've talked about this semester, going to be a lot of room for prudential judgment, right? Do certain industries, does a certain factory, does a certain type of mining uh, fit with these principles, right? And again, we could, we could debate any number of those specifics. Um, but over and over again, the response is going to be, um, well, how does this fit with a Catholic view of the person and of the world? Is this really going to promote the true flourishing of people considering all of the things that really make up a flourishing life and not just material prosperity. Um, while also acknowledging there does need to be a certain amount of material uh, prosperity and production to support um, human life. So uh, we will leave that there for now then. Uh, I look forward to hearing your thoughts on this reading and on these ideas. And in particular, you know, um, drawing on your experience as 
Christians and in most cases as Catholics uh, living and working uh, here mostly in, in Kansas in the Midwest is, uh, you know, what is your perception of this and how have you uh, talked about this with others uh, in a way that might be helpful to share with the rest of us? So again, uh, to my cohort here in spring 2015, thank you for your patience uh, and I look forward to hearing your thoughts on this uh, and to discussing it with you further.